Okay, so we are recording. So welcome everybody to your fabulous online lecture. Um, I think I have corrected or graded everybody's midterm test by now. Um, so your marks, I'll, I'll release those after class. I'll make them visible on Blackboard. And just be aware that that is your, the mark that you'll see doesn't have extra credit applied to it. So I'll, um, I'll email you once I have updated those marks at the end of the week, just so you can see what the marks were uh, before extra credit. And then I'll apply those, those extra marks um, that were from your group film projects, okay? Um, does anybody have any questions about that? And I'll give you a few seconds to turn on any mics if you want to ask a question or make a comment. No, I don't think so. Okay. So, um, what we are talking about today, and um, let me go to playing the PowerPoint. Okay, there's a lot going on on my screen at one time, but um, I, uh, oh, I just want to see if I click out of that recorder, if it, yeah, it's still recording. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so full screen again, we're talking about uh, landscape and cinema today. Um, so we've already We've already talked about this in relation to kind of issues of uh, romanticism, romanticizing Ireland, um, how this is seen particularly through one of um, more kind of classic envisionings of, of Ireland and Irish culture, like the quiet man. Um, and we've seen um, how uh, the landscape often features, at least in the background, uh, of films, this can even be seen in uh, in Hunger, which largely takes place within uh, prison walls. But there is that uh, key scene of um, of of Bobby Sands when he's 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 uh, remembering back to his childhood, this trip to Donegal that he took, um, and this is uh, realized in imagery on the screen. So you get a a, a kind of a view into, uh, for momentarily at least, this kind of more like bucolic, green looking Ireland that he has experienced. Um, so this could be seen as kind of a nod to that kind of uh, traditionalist or even romantic view of, of Ireland um, as kind of, you know, green fields and pastures. Uh, so even in a kind of dark film like uh, Hunger, that's apparent. It's a constantly recurring um, kind of trope of Irish cinema, um, that there's this kind of, uh, reversion to, and you could even say regression to, um, depicting the landscape, um, arguably, and this is kind of, I guess, a key point that I want to make, uh, this is the main theory that we're dealing with. And now this is a theory that's very up, very much up for debate, but you could, or some people have argued anyway, that um, Irish cinema is kind of defined by, or, or even kind of made into a genre unto itself by its, its constant kind of depiction of the landscape and its preoccupation with the landscape and, see, and its scenery um, as kind of a, um, a, a subtext to each film, uh, to, to every film within kind of uh, the remit of, of Irish national cinema. Um, so we're going to look at perhaps why that is and how this can be seen and uh, maybe how this manifests in uh, both the films that we have seen uh, and future ones um, that, that you will, yeah, ones that you will see in the future. Um, now, the film that I've asked you to, to look at for this week, um, which is Intermission, um, might not immediately seem like the most kind of exemplary film uh, in terms of Irish films that depict uh, the Irish landscape, or at least the traditional Irish landscape. Uh, but it's, it's precisely for that reason that I wanted you to watch that film, because there's a very key scene um, of kind of, which it, like literally and figuratively represents a collision 
of um, the Irish, the traditional Irish landscape, the romanticized landscape, um, and the more kind of urban milieu that that the um, the narrative takes place in for the most part. So we can come back to that. Um, okay, so so we're talking about um, landscape in uh, both terms of the, the the kind of traditional kind of green fields and pastures of Ireland, but also um, in terms of kind of like a, a setting. A, a scenescape for a film. So landscape in this sense will also be seen to, to um, comprise ideas of place and space. Now, how do I move forward with this? Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, somebody, sh anybody shout out if they can't uh, see me moving through the PowerPoint as we go. Okay. And, uh, and remember, you can shout out questions, just turn on your microphone and then start speaking, basically. So where does this preoccupation with the land <laughs> come from uh, in Irish cinema? Um, it harks back to uh, a similar preoccupation with the, with the land and the landscape that can be seen um, in other forms of Irish art and culture and folklore. Um, definitely and particularly Irish literature um, emerging after uh, the middle of the 19th century. So a lot of um, uh, plays and poetry and novellas written by um, Irish authors at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century use the landscape of Ireland as kind of a, a, a heavily a representational object to talk about um, Irish values and particularly like revolutionary values. Um, and so in this sense, like the, the landscape of Ireland is, is you know, it's the, the a body of land that is uh, quite contested politically um, and carries a lot of, of representational uh, weight and value. Um, the reason why this kind of emerges arguably out of the, the mid 19th century is precisely, precisely to do with um, the, the potato famine or the great hunger in Irish uh, on Gorka Moor, um, which is when, um, and this is to borrow a phrase from that article on Volta.ie, the Irish landscape on film, during this, this time when, quote, the land failed us or when the land failed the Irish people. So during the potato famine, of course, We've talked about this a little bit already. Um, this, the, the potato crop failed um, and millions of Irish citizens all of a sudden um, were unable to feed themselves um, and also to do with kind of the, the strict rules imposed on them by uh, Anglo landlords who weren't giving them assistance. And this led to a um, vast wave of immigration out of Ireland and also a lot of death within Ireland. So it could be seen as this kind of moment of um, national trauma, shared trauma on behalf of the Irish people when that, that the very land on which they, they lived um, and uh, from which uh, they eked their existence failed them. Um, and ever since, uh, it could, could be argued, the Irish have been kind of preoccupied um, with kind of the sense of, of getting back to a, a relationship with the land. And the land is both kind of um, providing sustenance and safety for the populace, um, but also uh, it, it, in a kind of in an unreliable way, so that the land can also be dangerous um, and a, a site of of trauma. So, um, arguably, this is why the the land is is such a kind of recurring feature of Irish literature um, and uh, now more recently cinema. Um, so uh, popular culture in general, it seems to be quite kind of embedded in the Irish psyche. Um, any questions about that going so far? Any terminology I've used? Oh, okay. So, um, uh, and also just to give you an example of kind of... Um, literature that uh speaks to speaks to this and as uh, so a building on kind of discussions of like of mother ireland 
Um, that that figure of Kathleen Nihoulihan um, is one who's been written about by Yeats and other um, Irish poets. Um, kind of this embodiment and crucially female or feminized kind of embodiment of of Ireland um, that's that's seen as vulnerable. And um, this is something that's always been recurring. Um, and from that as well, there gets there's there's this trend in literature, Irish literature, especially of kind of like the turn of the century, so nineteenth into twentieth centuries, um, that kind of figure uh, prefigures or, or represents the west of Ireland um, as and, and that that body of land as kind of the seat of real um, uh, kind of true real na- Irish national character. So there's this begins to be this division between kind of kind of uh, Western rural Ireland, and now that would encompass both uh, kind of the Dingle Peninsula, where you were, where I am, um, and and also Connemara, those parts of Galway. So this that's Western, the west coast of Ireland, um, which is also kind of where where kind of the centres of of the Gwaeltacht or Irish speaking uh, centres of Ireland are to this day. So that that area versus kind of Dublin as kind of the urban centre, which has also been crucially um, the seat of English um, uh, power and influence in Ireland. So there's this kind of dichotomy between um, the urban Dublin and the rural, the west of Ireland. Um, and this is played up in um, kind of, uh, literature or plays like um, the, the Playboy of the Western World by John uh, Singh. Um, which is kind of a satirical um, play about kind of, um, kind of peasants in the west of Ireland and uh, very much playing up on an idea of, that would be favoured amongst um, Irish, uh, it, the Irish people and particularly kind of urban Dubliners. Um, and this is in kind of like the early uh, 20th century, by the way. Uh, Dublin,er is thinking of the the West as rural and uh, primitive, and we've already talked about this kind of like vision of the Irish as atavistic, so like primitive and regressive, and it's simultaneously kind of um, held up as an ideal, but also seen as kind of less than to a kind of more cosmopolitan urban population. So that's where that that's that's just to recall this idea of kind of you know the the split in the romantic or romanticization of Ireland. So as the pastoral versus this maelstrom. And that word maelstrom is, uh, so that word there, I think you can see the cursor as I'm circling it there. Um, uh, That word maelstrom being used by John Hill and images of violence um, as kind of like the British or the Anglo uh, vision of what Ireland, when it's not all packaged into like the cute and the pastoral, what Ireland is otherwise violent and a, and a kind of uh, and traumatic uh, landscape. So I just want to remind us all of these images of the pastoral versus um, the violent Irish landscape uh, that we have seen on film. So um, back to Mary Kate Danaher again. Um, and then the quiet man. This is the romant- pastoral romantic visioning of Ireland. Hey, is that real? She couldn't be. Ah, nonsense, man. It's only a mirage brought on by your terrible thirst. Come up, Napoleon. Um, I just want to check that that um, that you were able to um, see that. Now I can't see anybody's video. Sorry, somebody speaking. We could see it. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Um, okay, so 
that's a pastoral romantic vision of the landscape. Um, so old timey Ireland. And then that's what Neil Jordan literally blows up, uh, for example, in um, The Butcher Boy. Um, so this is through the eyes of Francie Brady, uh, the protagonist of The Butcher Boy, who's slowly going insane over the course of the film. So it takes place, a lot of the film, in kind of this rural Irish landscape. But we see gradually, um, by virtue of, of Francie's kind of um, abuse under the system uh, or the Irish culture in which he's embedded, how this bucolic landscape is actually becomes kind of more like this um, this so-called maelstrom. It's the real grand. So that's kind of a that's that's a kind of surreal um, vision of of the kind of uh, strife torn Ireland. The um, the pastor is literally blowing up in front of us. Um, so it's not you know it's it's taken to an extreme. Um, but there's there's something interesting I think about like this kind of the so the the world the post apocalyptic world that Francie Brady. Uh, imagines himself in after he imagines this lake uh, going up in a mushroom cloud behind him. Um, what kind of like landscape then uh, or space is Francie walking through um, after that image comes on the screen, after the, the mushroom cloud? If anybody wants to jump in there. Like a war, like a war zone almost. Yeah, absolutely. And would you say it is more um, kind of traditional landscape or is it slightly more like urban? It's more urban. It's like there's a lot of like buildings and mm. it's like a city was burned down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so like once Francie in his mind is entering into this more kind of like traumatic space, it's um, this kind of, the I think this brings out um kind of this this conflict inherent to a lot of um Irish culture about how like the fact of urbanization or modernization challenges these traditional images and um or, and representations of Ireland that we associate with the landscape um so Francie's psychic break is kind of literalizing um that kind of that conflict within Irish culture um and uh, and cinema any questions or comments before I go back to the PowerPoint? No. All right. So we have this association, as I've said, between with like Western Ireland as kind of uh, exemplary of uh, the of rural Ireland and the real Ireland. So the pre-colonized Ireland, perhaps you could say, the one least influenced by kind of British or Anglo uh, culture, which is associated then with um, Dublin in particular and kind of uh, outside influences of, of modernization and globalization. So um, we have this, uh, consistent kind of uh, return in a lot of Irish cinema um, to when a film is concerned with like um, representing a kind of more traditional or uh, at least stereotypical Irish culture, we almost always see it um, in terms of kind of a Western Ireland. 
So it's important that a film like uh, Leap Year, for instance, um, which is kind of like transplants a, a love story into Ireland and is about also um, the kind of uh, leading lady's return to Ireland as kind of her home of her ancestors and, and stuff, um, that she goes to Western Ireland. Um, and the film doesn't really um, bother too much with with Dublin, despite the fact that it's the capital of Ireland um, and has the most uh, dense population within Ireland. We're, we're used more to seeing images of rural Western Ireland, um, even though it's not uh, actually all that populous um, because it's associated with real Ireland. It, it stands in for a real Ireland. Um, now, I just I, I, on this slide, I put up this image from the opening credits of The Quiet Man um, because it's not perhaps immediately um, obvious why it's kind of idiosyncratic, I guess, in terms of of the film, most all of which actually after the credits, uh, after those opening credits takes place in a Western Ir Irish location. Um, but it's been suggested that these opening credits um, uh, show kind of the place from which the film diverges or, or the place from which Sean Thornton has left uh, in, before embarking on this return back to his home in the west of Ireland, uh, which you could maybe see in terms of like, these are pine trees on the right hand side um, and uh, kind of a building, relatively modernish looking in the background with water in the foreground. The water could stand in for the ocean that he's about to cross, but he's leaving a relatively kind of, um, if not urban, kind of more modernized society. And that's the only vision of it that we get from the beginning of the film. But the film in its beginning is very much about leaving that place and entering into or re-entering into this more kind of primitive um, homeland space of the real west of Ireland and that landscape. And remember, we talked about those kind of uh, frames within frames within the film, um, which kind of lead us deeper into this landscape. We see the landscape in initially through a window on the train, and then gradually we get closer into um, and uh, are actually within and on that land or landscape for the rest of the film, The Quiet Man. Okay, so this kind of trope of the return is very much um, prevalent within Irish cinema. Um, so it could be seen as perhaps a genre within Irish cinema. If Irish cinema is altogether um, a genre, maybe it is a genre defined by its its landscape. I'm going to go back in a second to um, talking about how genres can be defined and categorized because it can help us understand hopefully um, why how, how this theory can emerge about Irish cinema being a genre defined by its landscape. Um, and then it has subgenres within it. Um, and this is this is mentioned um, both within Con Hollihan's article and also that that art article, if I remember correctly, on Volta um, about this kind of the, a subgenre of the journey back into Ireland or the uh, like the the road movie as well. Um, this this kind of constant um, narrative trope of characters venturing back to their homeland or uh, and especially back to the west of Ireland um, as a as a means of getting back to a sense of self or finding oneself. So this is um, exemplified by uh, the movie Into the West, which I'm just gonna show you the trailer for because I couldn't find any clips that were good enough anywhere else. Uh, it is um, a film from 1992 about a traveler family, um, uh, the father of which the, the patriarch, I guess, is played by Gabriel Byrne. Um, who has his wife has died by the the beginning of the film, and uh, the the family is down on their luck. Uh, they have a horse named Tiernanog, which is a nod to um, the kind of uh, folklore Irish myths surrounding the uh, Tiernanog being the the land of the everlasting young. Um, uh, his kids uh, go off on this journey on this horse. 
uh, out to the west of Ireland that's supposed to kind of represent their their freedom, but also um, a return to kind of a closeness with their mother. The horse comes to stand in for their mother. It's like, I, I'm not going to get too much into it now, but um, it's, it's about this idea of, of returning to the home um, and uh, kind of the, the domestic unit. So I'll play you the, um, the trailer now. What's his name? He's called Tier Nano. And why is he called that? Because he came from a land under the sea. Why he came was a mystery. By God, I say you must have the gift. But now two young brothers can ride into the West. We were travelers once, Tim and Oak. We were like gypsies. Why are you talking to the horse? Why not? We don't even believe that you are harboring ponies. That's true. A man who was lost. Your father was a great man, you know. King of the Travelers, is that what you want? Can now find out who he truly is. I knew you'd be back. <laughs> oh, man. I need your help. Oh, my God, you're right, Sonny. Papa, stop them. Stop them, Papa. Yeah, yeah. For a place where magic still lives in the air. The last few boys, what am I going to do? If they only believe it. Where's this horse leaving me? Why is he bringing me back to all the old places? Oh, Jesus, Mary and Johnson. Is it us they're after? Sure it is. Them two boys never forgot the tricks of the shambles. How did we get into this? It's not my fault. They're heading due west. The wild west. A lot going on in that film. <laughs> um, does anybody, did anybody pick up on what kind of, what might be an interesting juxtaposition in terms of spaces in which that film takes place? There is obviously kind of an urban space in which the family is is living at first, and that's the place that they leave um, the journey away from which and then into the West, into the West literally being the name of the film, representing the fathers and the families um, return to and recognition recognition of their identity. Um, we haven't dealt too much with um, uh, like representations of, of travelers in Irish cinema. I'm just I'm curious if anybody has heard of travelers or if you've talked about this in any of your other classes. I've heard of travelers, just not in detail. OK, so I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail right now because I'm also not an expert in um, that, that kind of facet of Irish culture and jazz cultural group. Um, actually, technically, they used to be referred to as an ethnic group in Ireland, but um, essentially travellers um, are seen as a minority of people within Ireland referred to it, tra referred to as travellers because they uh, culturally reject the idea of settling into um, you know a, a stationary house and and owning land and so on and so forth. Um, so they would tend to um, uh, practice kind of. Um, I don't want to use the word itinerancy because um, that has negative con connotations. 
Um, and this can be quite um, uh, uh, kind of a controversial topic in Ireland as well. There is quite a lot of um, uh, resentment, I guess, uh, between kind of say like the middle class and, and traveler population about um, their kind of countercultural um, tendencies, but they they will more often than not live in kind of in mobile homes um, in either caravan parks or, or on the side of the road. You might see travelers sometimes parked up there um, and just in general, don't kind of buy into the same kind of strictures of uh, middle class or bourgeois, you could say, um, Irish society. Uh, all that said, so it's it's kind of they're defined more by their cultural differences, I suppose, than they are by any type of kind of ethnic difference. Uh, ethnically speaking, travelers are uh, exactly the same and as as pearly white, <laughs> I guess you could say, as uh, as the as the majority of the the rest of the Irish population. Um, so they descend from the same like Celtic, you know, populations and stuff. Um, but they they have developed as a as a, a different culture unto themselves. They're very very Catholic, um, so not religiously distinct. Um, perhaps more conservative, even um, in terms of their their religious and social practices in that respect. Um, but they just they they don't uh, tend to settle uh, anywhere. So, but they have been looked at or, or represented in some um, Irish literature and uh, and and overall kind of perhaps stereotyped as being in some ways more Irish than the Irish than than uh, kind of middle class Irish um, because they are traditionally homeless um, and uh, don't uh, subscribe to the same notions of kind of land ownership. Um, they exist on the land, but they don't tend to own land. Um, so it okay. I'll, that's a tangent now, but that's that's the the kind of the, the character is that into the West is dealing with kind of treating these characters who are who travel the land as kind of most at home in this kind of wild Western Ireland. Um, it's a bit more kind of pastoral or a, or a gentler representation of of the land, landscape or the Irish land as kind of you know this this kind of comforting home and associated with the mother as well quite crucially. Um, that then say a representation like. Uh, that in the field, which is a film by Jim Sheridan. Um, the quality of this is pretty bad, even on a, my laptop. And as it is now, once I've blown it up, it's probably going to be worse. But I want to show you the end of the film as kind of a counterpoint to that, perhaps more like uh, warm envisioning of of kind of like the embracing homeland of Western Ireland. Uh, this film, The Field, which is an adaptation of a uh, John B. Keane play, um, subscribes more to that kind of uh, harsher primitivist, primitivist uh, representation of Ireland. Uh, so all of the film is available on YouTube, actually, um, but I've skipped ahead to the end. Uh, what to say about what's going on in this film? Um, it builds on kind of similar themes to The Quiet Man in that the protagonist, um, Bull McCabe, who is played by uh, Richard Harris, um, is contesting ownership of a field. And we see from the beginning that he is obsessed with with the idea of, of owning land and, and being part of it, working in, in concert with the land, trying to uh, kind of overcome its limitations, but also always kind of necessarily in that kind of symbiotic relationship to the land um he feeds off of it but he's also always in conflict with it um he can't he can't imagine a life apart from it um he forces his son played by sean bean to kind of try to take on ownership of uh, and authority over the the land but uh his son rejects it so at the very end of the film um and there's also a lot of other plot that happens but towards the end of the film um his son is trying to get away from Bull McCabe, the father, um, but Bull McCabe refuses to um, kind of come to terms with with um, this kind of rejection of this traditionalist way of life. Now, you know, because the son is, called, is played by Sean Bean that he's um, going to die. Um, and so we're going to see that happen. 
this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us it is not into temptation deliver us from evil One of the things I think is really interesting about the end of the field um, that also recalls some of the imagery and subtext of, of a film like Into the West is that uh, is this image of Bull McKay beating back the waves um, from his son's dead body. And the implication is as well that Bull McCabe is, is going to just he's, he's losing it and he's just he's going to go out into the waves until he drowns. Um, so he's he's totally kind of giving in to this obsession with with the land, but it's, strangely, it's not actually the land that's swallowing him up. It's it's the sea, which is kind of like ceaselessly um, making its way uh, into the land, crashing against the rocks, you know. And it's is this kind of a ceaseless force against which he, as a representative, perhaps of of the land. Uh, kind of has, tries to beat back against the waves could also be seen to represent kind of modernization and uh, a, a, as well <clears throat> that's another kind of subtext of, of the film 
that he's he's heavily resistant to uh, social and cultural change. Um, so that's he's beating back against that, but it's it can't be resisted, um, and that he ultimately he'll he'll um, he, he either has to change or die, and so he chooses death. Um, <clears throat> so we could perhaps see that there's this kind of dichotomy between, say, the land and the sea uh, in Ireland, and maybe the sea against which, like, the, the land is always literally and figuratively abutting. The sea represents the, the forces of change that, that can't be resisted, maybe. Um, in Into the West, um, there's this this kind of, you, you hear the snippet at the, the kind of, um, uh, of audio saying, um, uh, the horse Tirnanog emerged from the sea, referencing the 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 um, the the myth which Tirnanog is is a land of the youth, but it's supposed to be kind of underwater, and the, the horse that represents it comes from the sea. Um, there's a similar kind of allusion to this kind of um, a, a break between the real land and the figurative land, and the sea representing something counter to the the reality of the land of, of Ireland. So there's again this kind of like um if if not overt conflict between like the urban and the rural there's often a suggestion that um the kind of associations of the the land with kind of a perfect real and primitive ireland is kind of it's an unstable association there's always something a little bit off about it um okay back to the powerpoint So I guess I'm trying to get at the, how there's there's like an inherent unease uh, within a lot of Irish films that that have the landscape either as its background or even as a kind of uh, a, as an important narrative point, uh, unease about what it represents, and it's often not as simple um, as it as it as it purports to be. We can see this even in The Quiet Man, where um, there's this kind of self-reflexive awareness of the fact that the landscape is, all, is a representation, or at, at least it's being mediated through somebody else's eyes, be those eyes belonging to uh, Sean Thornton or to um, John Ford himself as, as a director who's trying to make a film about uh, a character's return to Ireland, which is also about his own return as a director, as an Irish-American, to this homeland where he is making this film. So the landscape is a very much loaded symbol and filled with kind of contradiction um, and instability. So, um, just to bring in some of kind of um, the more kind of theoretical material um, referenced in uh, Con Hollihan's article um, about uh, the Irish cinema and landscape. Um, the land, the land seems to kind of stand in as what he he calls a quote symbiotic expression of a volatile Irish people. Um, it's a a fraught image, um, a symbol that could be read as either positive or or negative. Um, much like the the people who populate that landscape, um, can't be kind of read one way or the other might see that at like um, face value or surface level of a film but almost all of these films could be seen to be perhaps subtly interrogating something about the nature of of uh of irish society by way of its representation of a landscape um what is kind of perhaps even more complicated in that these representations that we're looking at are all films now um is that kind of Interestingly, film has often been associated with um, an urban society and urban viewership. So I'm not talking just in terms of kind of Irish cinema now, but film could be seen as it, it, it is kind of a it is a new media um, and a highly technological one because it's predicated on photography um, and on projection. Um, and it first became popular in the early 20th century in urban um societies <clears throat> where films could be projected or, or disseminated to people en masse so it is film and cinema and uh, cinema going is inherently perhaps um an urban activity and it has now become more 
widespread and democratic, but it is made possible by urbanization um, and technological progress. So cinema and film making by like very definition almost resists those these kind of like stereotypical images of Ireland or of what Ireland as a land and a landscape is supposed to represent. So that's another site of kind of like inherent conflict in any Irish film is that as a film, it's modern. It's a modern res representation, but so many of these films are either about or are trying to interrogate issues of the traditional um, and the stereotypical um, and the rural, um, which Ireland seems to be defined by. So I've used this image here from um, intermission of Colomini, whose character is a very urban Dublin cop or detective against this um, kind of pasture uh, uh, background or landscape, um, which he kind of has to, I was going to say retreat, but it's not a retreat. Um, it's a pursuit, uh, the, the point in the film in which he he comes out into this landscape. But there's this kind of like, it's it's a confrontation in multiple ways, this scene, both for his, the characters that, that we see in it, including um, uh, this character, Jerry, and the, the gangster, Lahif, um, conflict between them, but also conflict in terms of what they represent as urban Dubliners and also this landscape that they have entered out into. Um, and this this can be seen as kind of a metaphor for Irish cinema's kind of preoccupation with the landscape and the land. Um, okay, so this is where in the last uh, 15 minutes or maybe less, uh, depending, uh, minutes of the lecture, I want to get into some genre theory. And kind of finally set up how we could think of Irish cinema as a genre of films that's defined uh, both semantically and syntactically by uh, a kind of a hyper visualization of landscape. Um, so I'm going to have to define for you what semantically and syntactically what those words mean. Uh, so these two terms, semantics and syntax, are used by the film theorist Rick Altman to um, approach how to talk about and how to categorize genres in cinema. So a genre being a type of film, basically. So we all kind of know what genres are when we think of the examples in Hollywood cinema, at least. So you've got like action films, you've got rom-coms, you've got detective films, um, horror films, excuse me, um, and so on and so forth. And a lot of them are um, identifiable in terms, interestingly, of um, the kind of the space in which they're set. So that's a kind of an icono iconographic point. So we know, well, by iconographic, I mean, we know what a certain type of film how it a certain type of film is going to go because of how it looks and where it's set. Where it's set is an example of how it looks and um, and the kind of signs and symbols that we're going to expect to see from the film as the narrative plays out. That's what I mean by icono icon <laughs> can't say it iconography, and this is uh, what Altman calls a kind of a semantic structuring of um, of a film genre. So it's it's also what he calls its building blocks. Images and sounds that we tend to associate with a certain genre. So let me just get out of this PowerPoint for a second and open up my video. So whoever is going to speak, I can see them. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll name, a genre or two for you and uh, I want somebody anybody to jump in with what they might expect its icono iconography to be so uh, sounds or images things that you'd expect from this genre so uh, what about a gangster film black and white suits Tommy guns yeah, great. All yeah, 
all images or, or like uh, visual images, but also um, can you think of any like sounds that we might ex uh, associate with a gangster film? Uh, Robert, again, since you're Mike is on. Brooklyn accents, gunshots. Yeah, exactly. Jazz music. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, all generic elements of a gangster film, um, 100%. Um, now, not every single gangster film might have every single one of those um, uh, building blocks and such or, or, or elements of iconography, but they probably have a good few of them to the point where we recognize just looking at and hearing the film that it probably belongs to the gangster genre. Um, where does, uh, and I'll ask... Um, Somebody other than Robert, <laughs> where does a gangster film tend to take place? What type of setting? Urban. Brooklyn. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So urban landscapes. You kind of have to, a, a gangster kind of relies on an urban milieu to exist, both in the real world and um, in in the not so real world on, on film. No, not perhaps exclusively. But a gangster is kind of originally, or at least initially, a, an urban phenomenon. Um, now, another genre. So somebody other than Robert or other than Amy, tell me about iconography of a rom-com. Typically in, um, in Irish cinema, like Leap Year would be somewhere like in like a kind of like a honeymoon area, um, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So that's, so we've got like a, yeah, a setting a little bit less defined. And I will say, actually, I wasn't even thinking of this when I asked about the rom-com. Um, it's, it's less defined by its place than other genres might be because um, we have rom-coms, so not just in Irish cinema, uh, but like in, in Hollywood cinema, cinema and all different kind of locales. But I think that's a good note to, to make, Louisa, is that often it's kind of like a honeymoonish kind of place, um, almost like fairy tale like or if not, it's often urban, but like a place of a lot of possibility. Um, what yeah. else? Somebody else tell me what else we might expect to see, uh, like sounds, music, maybe um, and yeah. other images. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Maybe like happy music, yeah. like lighter music. Absolutely. Good point, Kathy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Upbeat kind of music mm -hmm. and a lot of pop songs oftentimes. Um, mm -hmm. And Kathy, can you think of uh, an image you might expect to see from a, from a rom-com or a type of scene? Um, I don't know. I'm thinking like the notebook and maybe like a sad scene. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm yeah absolutely that like yeah that that scene where the uh heroine is probably is crying yeah at some stage yeah the tear is coming down tears mm. are, are an important kind of iconographic <laughs> feature of both a rom-com and also a melodrama and those two genres are perhaps distinguished by um one being more happy themed and the other being more uh sad themed so in this case, actually, this is, and this is like, just a side note, Rick Altman's kind of structure for determining and categorizing genres breaks down because in those, the rom-coms and melodramas often look exactly the same, except that they are designed to elicit different emotions from an audience. So a rom-com makes us laugh and a melodrama mm -hmm. makes us cry. So this is, this is where this theory does totally break down, but that's just a side note. So I'm going to go back to pretending like this theory is foolproof. Um, so we've talked about like the gangster film, how it has certain icon iconography, romantic comedy has different iconography. They have different spaces or places that they tend to deal with. So that's, those are the semantic elements of those genres. In terms of syntax, this is where it gets harder, much, much, much harder to define a genre um, according to, to Altman's kind of methodology. But he suggests that each genre is kind of also in kind of relation to the iconography or the semantic structure that it sets up. It starts to develop a certain kind of ideological meaning that often is defined by a kind of conflict in ideologies. Um, so this is like he calls it it's it's a meaning bearing structure to a genre. Um, so. Um, Somebody who hasn't spoken yet, could you 
tell me or kind of try to guess what might be a kind of ideological conflict in a gangster film. Think about how the narrative tends to go um, with uh, usually there's some kind of like, you know, transgression against law. Um, does the hero tend to succeed or are they, do they tend to get a comeuppance? Um, what do we think? You don't, you don't have to say it in terms of actually like a one thing versus another. What, what do you think is an overall kind of theme for a gangster film that doesn't have to do just with its icono iconography? Um, maybe talking about like, you know, like you said, like transforming somebody from doing evil things and bad things into doing something good because they had like some sort of influence or like a light kind of went off in their head in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and that just could be from like a scenery change or like where they like moved or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's, a, there's this idea of, of the law is, is really important. 100%. Um, and it's in terms of a gangster film, um, generally we see kind of like an individual up against the law. And for a gangster film, it's often an individual kind of looking out for number one themselves versus society. And the gangster usually actually comes to an unhappy end in most films, not, not exclusively. And definitely in more modern films, we get more anti-heroes and we don't need to have constant reminder that if you do be bad things in society, you're going to go to jail. But older gang gangster films tend to follow that, that route. So if, genres do develop as well, certainly. But you get the, the personal versus the law. So that's a syntax and an ideological conflict that sets up the overall meaning of a gangster film. We get a similar kind of uh, ideological conflict in a genre like the Western, let's say. And I'm not talking about Western as in like Western Ireland here. I'm talking still about Hollywood cinema. So we tend to get still like the Lone Ranger type. So the individual, the lone cowboy versus a society. And often it, and oftentimes it's actually a lawless one. So it's a, a lawless society as opposed to the law that the gangster is up against. But it's a similar ideological conflict. But the distinguishing features here is this, this is where the semantics of the genre come into play. So the iconography of the Western help us define it as a genre versus the iconography of the gangster film that has a similar syntax. I'm, I know these are like confusing terms, but those two genres, just as examples, have similar syntaxes, but their semantics helps, uh, help us kind of define them or to, to categorize the films for ourselves. So we can understand the narratives and how they, they play out and what they're supposed to say about society better. Whereas other films like, um, I'm trying to think of two genres that have similar, and, oh yeah, we already talked about it. Two genres that have similar iconography, the rom-com and the melodrama, um, they, they look very similar, but they have different syntaxes perhaps because one, the rom-com is about for the most part, heterosexual union and the melodrama is about heterosexual um, disunion. So I'm painting very generally here, but so this is, hopefully this helps describe how these two kind of different ways of looking at genre structurally, so semantics and syntax help to create categories of, of films, one versus the other. Okay, so I've kind of set that up at length. And this is how Hollywood genres tend to be distinguished. If we're judging Irish cinema by the same kind of, against the same structure of meaning making, Irish cinema tends to, depending, like regardless of its narrative or even its ideological viewpoint, seems to keep coming back to this idea of landscape as kind of a crucial, uh, so not idea of landscape, sorry, the image of landscape as a crucial um, iconographic feature. It's almost, it's always there. Um, in some way, shape or form. And if the film isn't set in the kind of the countryside, it's set in a, a like heavily urban milieu like intermission and still at some point seems to have to reference the outside to make sense of itself as being an Irish film. 
uh, sorry, the outside as being the, the kind of rural countryside outside the cinema, uh, outside the city. Um, so iconographically, it's defined by this landscape or, or the landscape when it's not seen. And then some syntactically, in terms of its ideology and its meaning bearing structure, that landscape always brings up these ideas of kind of traditionalism and the and real reality of an Irish society and culture and what it means to the point that like Irish films seem to be so preoccupied with this both semantically and syntactically. So we get perhaps an Irish cinema overall that is a genre unto itself, whereby the landscape defines both the semantics and the syntax and it unites it as a theme altogether. And then underneath that, we get kind of subgenres of Irish cinema. So ones that are like the journey film and others that are more like um, a kind of folklore, a fairy tale story and, uh, and so on and so forth. So subgenres from this overall landscape type of cinema. Um, so before I get to briefly talking about Ryan's daughter, um, which blessedly you don't have to watch. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? Like that's pretty heavy theory actually that I've kind of run through very, very quickly. So please shout out if you've got questions. I don't think so. No, okay. Great. That was the easiest uh, lecture on genre theory that I've ever given. And I've given much longer lectures on it. Um, as in, I think everybody got the important points, hopefully. Um, okay, so I guess I've just argued that Irish cinema is like, it's its, its own genre. That's, that's what I put forth. I would argue against that on, on, on the other hand, till the cows come home, not to belabor the rural associations, but um, you could you could argue either way, basically. So I, I'm not asking you to 100% agree with this theory. I don't 100% agree with it either, but it's just one way of kind of conceptualizing Irish cinema. So let's just take a brief look at one of the most famous uh, films that was shot on location in Ireland. So it deals heavily, heavily with the Irish landscape and just so happens to have been shot on the Dingle Peninsula and for the most part west of Dingle. So before you guys were unceremoniously wrenched away from Dingle and brought back to America, I think you at least took one or two um, uh, field trips out to kind of back west to see the coastline around Dingle. So you should recognize hopefully some of um, the background scenes. Um, Ryan's Daughter is a British made film but still talked about in terms of Irish cinema because it existed before indigenous Irish cinema was really taking off. So it was one of these main kind of uh, films about Ireland that even though it wasn't made in Ireland, it still informs very much how we think about Ireland on film. And it is definitely a romanticization of, of Ireland and Irish culture. Um, I'm going to play the trailer for you first and then I'll, I'll, show you a brief clip um that kind of uh really exemplifies how nature is nature and the irish landscape is used in this kind of pastoral romantic uh manner in the film um but uh also importantly and just in terms of kind of the history of dingle ryan's daughter when it was shot here in 1969 um kind of put dingle on the map as a tourist location um, there would be no Sacred Heart, in, Sacred Heart University in Dingle without Ryan's daughter because it wouldn't have become kind of a, a hub for tourism and culture in Ireland uh, if it wasn't for this film. Um, so it was shot on location, all these actors, including Robert Mitchum, who is a, a then Hollywood star. He's the main uh, character, or, or well, a male protagonist in the film. Um, yeah, not Irish at all, Hollywood actor. Um, he was, he was shipped over and stayed here for months on end. Um, apparently was like smoking, drinking and womanizing all day long um, when he, where he was holed up in his B&B. There are many kind of local stories about, um, salacious stories about him. Um, anyway, a lot of local people kind of got jobs based kind of through the film, like either kind of 
um, doing construction work or being employed as extras in the film. So it's quite like um, uh, important to this to the local history around here, despite the fact that it is a terrible, terrible film. Um, and you you get what you need to from the from the trailer. So um, it is quite beautiful to look at. Is the only thing <laughs> it's a saving grace. It deals in so many stereotypes of of Irish culture, um, and it's just which is quite offensive at, at various points. Um, but enjoy the scenery, and then also with a view to look at this trailer with a view to kind of seeing how. Um, the scenery can be seen as like as almost a character in and of itself. It's as in like it's kind of like a star, basically. It has that kind of uh, it's so important visually um, that it's it's we're meant to focus on it in each each shot. <laughs> From the director of Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, and Dr. Zhivago. David Lean's most beautiful film, Ryan's Daughter, A Story of Love. Starring Robert Mitchell. You'd never been faithful to me, would you? And Sarah Miles as Ryan's daughter. <sighs> Trevor Howard as Father Collins. Are you happy? No. What more are you wanting now? I don't know, Daddy. That's a lie. It's not. How can I know? I don't even know what more there is. Leo McKern is Thomas Ryan, the blustering pub keeper who turns out to be an informer. Bad luck to the British. Success to the Germans. And, and a very good morning to you, Corporal. John Mills is Michael, the village half wit who understands but cannot speak. And Christopher Jones is Randall, the English war hero. Ryan's daughter. A story of infidelity. Revolution. And love. Like Bridge on the River Kwai, Ryan's daughter deals with man's struggle against the forces of nature. Like Lawrence of Arabia, it is a study of the inner workings of the human mind. Like Dr. Zhivago, it is a story of love, set against a background of war and revolution. Like any film by David Lean, it is a masterpiece. It's not a masterpiece, but it's very pretty. Um, so I don't know if any of you were able to recognize any of the kind of the background locations that are used in the film. There is a shot that I don't know if you can actually, I don't know if you'll be able to see what the view is out here. Uh, there's some islands. I don't know if you can tell. Okay. They're kind of out there. That's there's a shot of the um the army dudes that you see there against the islands. Those are the Blasket Islands. So the a lot of the filming took place in Dunquin, where I am right now, and they built a whole village and stuff, and then tore it down subsequently after filming was ended. Um, but uh, so it's that's this is Ryan's daughter country right here. There are also shots that are shot on um Inch Beach and around Killarney. Um, and I'm actually just going to talk over this scene so that you don't have to listen to it in all its glory um this is the um major love scene from ryan's daughter um shot in and around the lakes of killarney 
um, really kind of exemplifies how the um, the lush scenery is supposed to function almost as another character in the film. This so it's about this affair that Ryan's daughter of the title has with this um, British soldier. So this illicit affair. She's married to Robert Mitchum's character. Um, so they have this tryst in the woods um, um, when they're indulging in this forbidden love affair. Um, so when they're, um, uh, how would you say, getting down to it, um, you see these kind of cutaway shots to animals and the greenery and the flowers um, that like stand in for commentary. So the, the last point that I'm gonna try to make, and there's not necessarily enough substance here to defend it, is that the landscape and the scenery and all these indigenously, not all, but in a lot of indigenously made Irish films and other films that are shot on, shot in and around Ireland, is that the, the the landscape is a star basically of of each film? So Irish cinema doesn't really picture stars in the same way that Hollywood uh, films and Hollywood genres overall might actually be defined by certain stars and their association with them. Um, so like action films might be associated with certain stars like Tom Cruise or um, Sylvester Stallone or what have you. Um, so stars are another kind of iconographic feature of, of cinema. Um, in Irish cinema, the star is usually actually the landscape um, and not so much the individual actors. And okay, we'll get rid of that now. Um, that didn't actually show you so much, so many of the cutaways to like flowers and stuff um, that are supposed to be kind of like poetic commentary on their love. But anyway, um, the, the landscape becomes just as kind of like a, as much of a kind of like speaking character in the film as the actors themselves who are all overacting and if they're not totally underperforming. But anyway, so that is your crash course in genre theory and Ryan's daughter and the landscape in Irish cinema and space and place. Um, I've asked you to watch intermission, so please do that and get your film reviews in. I have posted, um, uh, the directions for the film review for intermission is to talk about landscape and place and space specifically in relation to the film. So it has slightly different directions to the last two film reviews. It's actually more open-ended probably. Um, but so make sure that you're referencing its use of, of location. Um, and, uh, and please feel free to bring in whatever kind of, you know, context that you can from this lecture and from the reading, the reading response that we do the following a week from today. Um, in your reading response journal. Um, any questions on any of that? Anything you'd like me to clarify or go over? I don't have a question on that, but when everyone logs off, um, can I just talk to you for like a quick second? And you need to turn on your microphone, Louisa, sorry. Um, can you hear me? No. Oh, okay, sorry, say that again. Um, when everyone logs off, can I just talk to you for a quick second? No problem. Yep. Okay. Um, anybody else? Um, I don't hear anybody else. So if you do have a question, feel free to put it on the, um, whatchamacallit, group me, text chain, and also make sure to engage with the discussion forum in some way, shape, or form this week. You didn't have to last week because of the test and stuff. Um, and there was something else that I wanted to say to you, but I have forgotten what it is. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to, I've hopefully been successfully recording this lecture. If I haven't successfully done that, I will post a kind of a um, few notes in like audio form uh, for you to be able to access, but um, hopefully this has recorded. So I'll just make this lecture accessible 
on uh, WebEx or however it gets posted. So please let me know if you can't find it. I should know by later today whether it's posted successfully or not. So I'm not sure if I have to reshare it with you or whether you should all have access already anyway. But I'll find that out. Okay, so unless there are any questions, I will let you all get back to your Mondays. I think that's it. So feel free to log off and Louisa, I'll hang on to chat to you. Okay. And have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You too. Thanks. Let me just see how many people are left in the meeting, Louisa, before we start chatting. I think it's just you now, but let me check. Yep, yeah, it's just us two, so talk away. <laughs> is, it, is it still recording? Oh, no, it is. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs>